People who are regularly watch my streams probably know that I'm a huge fan of the PPM format. And the reason why I like this format is because it is so simple that you can process it directly without using any third party dependencies or any libraries. So let's quickly do that. Let's open a file and let's call this file something like output PPM. Let's open it for writing as a binary file. What's interesting about this format is that it starts up as a text format and then switches to a binary format. So the first thing you have to do, you have to output line P6. And I suppose this is some sort of like a magical number of the format. So the next line will contain the dimensions of the image that you want to output. So let's actually put them into a variable and decide on our dimensions. So I think I want to have a ratio of 16 by nine, but the factor, let's say that the factor is going to be 16. All right, so let's actually output them in here, width and height. And the last text line is supposed to be the maximum value of the color component and usually in case of p6 it's 255 so after that it switches to a binary mode and you're supposed to output the triplets of bytes basically red green and blue components of each individual pixel let's iterate first rows starting from zero up until h then iterate the columns from 0 to W. And for each individual pixel, let's output red component, no green component, and no blue component. So let's try to generate just a red rectangle. After that, let's close the file. And what I usually like to do, I like to print what program has generated. So let's actually factor out the name of the file and reuse it in here, saying something like generated as output path. And let's return zero. So let's go ahead and try to compile it and run it. And as you can see, it in fact generated output PPM. Let's take a look at the folder and we do in fact have output PPM. And if we open it in Emacs, Emacs has a built-in image viewer. It will show you a red rectangle. So essentially PPM format is actually relatively known. So any software that uses common image libraries will recognize that format. And that's one huge advantage of this format. So let's try to generate something more interesting. For example, a checker pattern. Let's decide on the size of cell, let's actually say it's going to be 60 since the dimensions are divisible by 60. If we divide x by 60, we get the column of the cell. And if we divide y by 60, we get the row of the cell. If you sum them up, you get an index and you can distinguish whether you need to color a particular cell one color or another by checking if it's even or odd. If it is odd, like in this case, we're going to be coloring it red. Otherwise, let's color it black basically by setting the red component to zero. And there we go, we got a checker pattern. In fact, you can generate more than one image. Let's actually generate 60 of them and let's create an animation of this checker pattern moving somewhere. How can you move it? You can basically offset X and Y components. For example, I can maybe add 10 to X and 10 to Y. What is going to happen if I do that? The whole pattern has shifted. Let's repeat it 60 times. Let's organize a loop where we iterate from zero to 60, like so. And we're gonna use I as the offset. And for each individual iteration, let's create a separate frame. We need some sort of a buffer where we're gonna be storing the name of the file frame we're going to be generating. So let's actually allocate it on the stack. I think 256 characters should be enough for us, hopefully. So the way we're gonna be generating the name is we're gonna be using s and printf function. It accepts the buffer, also the size of the buffer, so it doesn't overflow. And then you can just use it as a regular printf, except it's going to produce a string instead of printing that string to the standard output. So so in here, we're going to say the output is going to be D PPM and you just provide the I. So we're using I simultaneously as an offset and as an index for this specific file. One thing I like to do, I like to left pad this index with zero. So they're all aligned and look nice. So let's go ahead and try to generate 60 files. Ascend printf. Oh, of course, ascend printf returns how many characters it generated. So what we have to do instead, we have to assign buffer to the output pass. So the rest of the code that uses output that knows where to get the file. That's what we have to do. As you can see, we generated 60 frames. I can now open them in Fech, which is an image viewer, and I can basically step through them manually. But what I can do with these frames now, I can feed them into FFmpeg. FFmpeg has this very cool feature that it accepts not only a video files and input, but also a sequence of images. So what you can do, you can provide sort of like a pattern of these images. So in our case, the pattern is output, and then you can literally use a pre 
printf syntax to specify the pattern. So you put percent zero two d literally the pattern that we had in our printf in here, and that tells ffmpeg to grab all of these files and use them as an input video. Then we're gonna say that the fps of this video is gonna be sixty, and let's output into output mp4, and it just produce a video that we can open with mpv. And this is why I like ppm format because it's very simple and it's well known without any third party dependencies at least in the C code in the C code I just produced a bunch of image files and I fed them into software infrastructure and software infrastructure just picked them up and now I can do animations a really complex one actually in fact I can even do shaders Let's take a look at very interesting shader artist Zor Dev. And if you never heard about Zor Dev, I really recommend to check him out. He creates these beautiful shader animations. And he always posts also the code that produces such animations. And here is the code. It is a small shader. For those who don't know, shaders are programs that are executed on your GPU. And this is specifically a fragment shader, which means that it produces this image by executing this program for each an individual pixel simultaneously. And What's interesting is that if you think about it, this is literally what we're doing here. We're executing this piece of code for each an individual pixel, not simultaneously, but sequentially, but without using any graphical APIs. Can we, for example, take this entire code, copy paste it in here and produce the same image with the same idea? Let's literally copy paste this code and remove this one. Unfortunately, this is not going to work at all because this code is not written in C, even though it kind of looks like C, right? It's kind of dense. This is because it was called golfed. Uh, essentially, Zordev was trying to produce a shader, a cool shader with as minimal characters as possible. As far as I know, he actually made it down to 179. So let's actually use the latest one, which is much smaller. So that's the shader. So let's not use the bulky, huge one. Let's use the small one. So it's not really it's written in C, it is written in GLSL, and GLSL is the shader language of OpenGL. So if you try to compile this entire thing, it is obviously not going to compile because, for example, it doesn't have a type vector2. But vector2 is actually a rather simple type. It is literally a structure with two fields, X and Y. We can actually provide that. We can actually easily provide that. Uh, so the next thing, it doesn't have a FC. I suppose it stands for fragment coordinate. And in OpenGL terminology, fragment is basically a pixel. Not really, but you can treat it as a pixel. And what it tells me that this is probably the coordinate of the current pixel. It actually takes only X and Y component of it, which tells me that maybe in the environment where this shader is executed, fragment coordinate is not a two-dimensional vector. Maybe it's a three-dimensional one so maybe it has z for z buffering or whatever what we can do we can actually just like remove this thing and always assume that fc is a two-dimensional vector so let's do something like this Okay, and now we can't proceed any further because we're trying to multiply a two-dimensional vector by a scalar. And in C, it is literally impossible because we don't have an operator overloading. But you know what has an operator overloading? C++. We can actually switch to C++ specifically to make this shader compile. So I'm going to switch to CPP and let's actually try to recompile the whole thing so to make it possible to multiply a vector by a scalar, we literally have to overload a multiplication operator. So here we're going to be accepting the vector by a constant reference. Since we're using C++, we might as well go full on C++ and also a scalar. And this entire thing is supposed to return a new vector. So and here what we're going to do, we're going to just return a x multiplied by s, a y multiplied by s. And there you go. We overloaded this operator by making a little bit more of the shader compile. So it doesn't really like that uh, we're passing integers into a float vector. We might as well maybe cast them to something like float. And what you have to do, you have to just continue adding more and more shader features until you've basically implemented all of the missing operations and you essentially have a shader compatibility layer. And we still have some missing variables, for example, R. I can presume from my own experience, it is probably the resolution of the screen. So let's actually create it somewhere here. So let's actually have something like vector 2 R. And in here, we're literally going to have W and H. 
Another thing that we're missing is O variable. An O variable, from what I can understand, is actually a four-dimensional vector, and it's probably an output of the shader, the output of a single pixel. Let's actually allocate this four-dimensional vector here. And also, it wants to have T, which is probably time, right? Because the entire thing is animated. So let's actually provide the time. I suppose the time is going to depend on a current frame. And we can do the following thing. We can just basically interpolate the entire animation by taking I and dividing it by 60. So that means T is going to go from 0 to 1 through the entirety of the video. And of course, we want to do that in floats. And as you can see, it is generating frame, but we're not outputting anything into the files. So what we have to do, we have to take this output vector, which contains the components of the pixel, and put them as bytes into the PPM file. So the thing about OpenGL is that all of its color components are normalized. So that means that X, Y, and Z, they correspond to RGB, but they are values from 0 to 1 in floats. We have to convert them to values from 0 to 255 in bytes. Uh, the easiest way to do that is to literally just multiply them by 255 and that's it and just output them as bytes like so and just wait until it generates all of these 60 frames we might as well actually optimize it so it goes a little bit faster but in your case i can just cut into when it's finished and it's finished and let's generate a video out of that and let's take a look at the video and it's literally the same video but produced on cpu instead of gpu what that tells us that tells us that knowledge of specific languages, APIs, hardware is maybe important, but it is not particularly relevant. What is relevant is understanding what exactly you are doing and how to generate pixels. Once you know how to do that, you can actually work with any API.